Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today, my guest is an up-and-coming artist out of Everett, Washington, which is about, I'd say it's like 45 minutes out of Seattle, roughly around there. Yeah, give or take. And uh, he's set to release his uh, new album. You want to tell the the audience what the name of your new album album is? Yeah. Um, before I start, my name is Tavaron. I'm a singer, songwriter, and producer now from Seattle. Um, and I'm turning 21 in a few days. But, oh, shit. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, my debut album is called Ugly and it's kind of about the ugliness of your 20s and like finding the beauty in that ugly and just like all that ugly embarrassing shit that you'll do as like someone that's like trying to navigate life in like a new way so hell yeah Tavron it's the it's the first time I've ever heard anyone with a name like Tav. it's Tavron right mm-hmm. like is, is that just a, is that a family name or what is that name so it's Cambodian, and my dad's name is Tavarek, and then oh. so he like kind of like altered it a little bit, and um, my parents told me it means like strength and resilience. And growing up in Everett, like being colored, it's kind of like hard because it's like if you don't necessarily feel like you fit in. And so I used to go by my middle name, which is Tom, and um, <laughs> when or like Tommy, people would call me Tommy. And uh, when I moved to Seattle, it was like I feel like I'm not not like taking advantage of my name but like I'm not like living up to it Mm -hmm. and so I kind of like wanted to reclaim that power and um here I am now so you live in Seattle now yeah oh shit Mm -hmm. so what do you do for work besides uh music um I'm a server oh we're at Din Tai Fung oh yeah do you like it (laughs) yeah it's pretty nice I'm guessing it pays well if you're able to move from Mm -hmm. ever to Seattle yeah and my coworkers are dope (laughs) hell yeah so when did you start working at Din Tai Fung um almost it was like 20 like august 2019 so i don't know if that's like two or three five. oh shit so during the so was it open the entire time during the pandemic yeah but i like quit before like literally two weeks before covid happened and then um i didn't get unemployment for like lockdown oh. and so it was so lame but um yeah and then i was working at cheesecake and then my manager didn't i asked me to come back so i was like oh yeah so is this in bellevue then or actually uh seattle? the one in the village okay is there a cheesecake factory in seattle uh, it was in linwood okay yeah because the only cheesecake factory i i know of honestly is the one in bellevue and then, mm-hmm. then during the um the riots we had i just remember on the news this lady yeah. came out with a full cheesecake yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's craziness. Yeah. So you said it's kind of hard living in Everett, but I feel like isn't that a pretty diverse area for like? I feel like yeah, for the most part. But even then, it's it just gives me the same vibe as like Seattle in a sense, where it's like pushing like diversity and like super liberal and stuff like that. But it still feels kind of restrictive in a sense. Hmm. And I don't know if it's just because of like the people there or like the people that I was surrounded by, um, or like just like being in your hometown for like ever and like never leaving yeah um that in itself is restricting too and you're cambodian is that is there a big cambodian population in washington um (laughs) i would say so like in the south side which is why i felt like that because i'm from everett and like there wasn't that many cambodian people there i think i've actually had a cambodian on the podcast before. really do you know sari savvy I don't think so. I think he's from around Everett. You really? Guys, you guys should connect. He is, um, mm-hmm. I think I had him on before I rebranded. So this was like 2019, I think. And um, there's like there's actually a pretty cool artist community in Everett. And there's various forms of mm-hmm. art. Like, did you, were you surrounded by like artists when you were living in Everett? So I actually didn't start releasing music until I moved to um, Seattle and like, it was something that I had always done where like I always considered myself to be a writer first and then a musician, not to be like cliche, but um, I would like always write stuff when I was in Everett, but I never like decided to like take it upon myself to like go after that and like connecting with people like that. And so I feel like also because of that, it's super restrictive. And I feel like just like my mindset in the past wasn't the same as it is now. And um, now I'm like super grateful to be in Seattle and like releasing my own stuff and like meeting people like you and stuff. You know, it's just like yeah. hella crazy. So you're saying you've met more people living in Seattle than in Everett? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Even during the pandemic? Yeah, because it's just like you're surrounded like by people that you go to like high school with and like you're not close like that. Right. It's like, or you don't have like that desire to like 
maintain a friendship, if that makes sense. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but. No, I get that. I, I wasn't really close to a lot of people. I was a very big chatterbox in high school. So, like, <laughs> in, like, 20 years, if the NAS podcast is, like, the biggest thing on earth, people in high school are going to be like, oh, that guy who fucking wouldn't shut the fuck up in class. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you like in a, in a high school? Um, So, I actually did cheer in high school. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I did competitive cheerleading, and it was really fun. So, so you're flexible? Um, not as much as I used to be. It's kind of sad. I, like, did a backflip at a party, um, like, a few weeks ago, and it was, like, <laughs> I was really, like, gone, and then something happened, I, like, fell over on my face, and it was, like, really embarrassing. I was like, yeah, this is, like, why I retired. <laughs> was, it, was it on camera, at least? <laughs> no, thank God. <laughs> So you, I'm guessing you got on a table, or were you just standing straight up? And it was literally like in this like basement in someone's house, but it had like carpet on the floor, and so I like scratched my nose. That's that's awkward as yeah. fuck. Was, like everyone was like in a circle, and they were like watching me, and then that happened. There, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So are you part of any artist community now here in um, Seattle? I know that you've actually. I w- I had Scarlet Park on on. I um, saw that. But dude, this is the crazy part. I, so she showed me some of like the the list of artists that submitted to the thing, mm-hmm. and while she was in the room, your name popped up, and I was like, "Make sure you you," because there she had like a whatever it's called, like there's like fifty artists that submit or whatever, mm-hmm. and then like you cut down from there and you cut down from there. So, I, so I made sure you made it, made it for, through the first round at least. Thank you, <laughs> appreciate that. I was like, "Damn, Tab's going ham <laughs> right now. He knows what the connections to me." Yeah, um, she's dope, and I love what she's doing with the collective and. Um, like that was something that I was like so excited to be a part of and like I'm gonna like finesse my way into supernova this month <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying too. Like I, I, I Interview artists and I still get kicked out of because I'm 20 as well mm-hmm. So I still get kicked out of concert venues. Yeah. It's 21 plus. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna make it <laughs> and you turn so when did you turn 21 on the 29th? Oh, uh, mm-hmm. so you got another week and a half. Mm-hmm. She'll be she'll be back around. I feel like um I really don't know where the pandemic's going, but I feel like she's definitely going to try to throw some more mm-hmm. events. But this supernova thing, that's, I, I hope really I can cool. go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you been to like any clubs since uh, turning 18 at least? Or like, what is what, you, what is your like nightlife like in Seattle for you? Um, I don't really go out much. Um, like, but yeah, I've been to a few clubs in Seattle actually, because I have like, an F A K E I D. Oh, he's yeah. fake. FBI people watching. <laughs> Arrest this man right now. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I just like stay at home with my roommate and just like smoke. There we go. <laughs> you're, you're a stoner. Yeah. So what what actually got you into finally releasing music? Um, I think it was. I don't know. It, I just like felt this huge push, and like I was always like playing stuff, and I would play it for like like my really close friends and they'd be like this is so good like you need to release this but I was just so scared because I wasn't really like sure of how people were going to perceive it because it was like kind of random for me to release music I feel even though it's been like a passion of mine ever since I was little but it's something that I've always kept like hidden because like I don't know I like it was like not embarrassing to me but like embarrassing like I just like don't look at me like don't perceive me and stuff but um yeah I think it just like was this huge hurdle for me to get over and like just believing in myself and like realizing that this is what I want to do um and kind of just accepting that and like going with it so is it more just a social thing versus like a cultural thing I know a lot of different cultures don't really want their kids to focus on music because it doesn't seem like a mm-hmm. a thing that has longevity in it yeah like I my parents are super supportive and stuff but like it's still kind of like they only view it as like a hobby or like something that's not that serious even though like there's so much work that goes into it and so much passion that like it feels like a job almost um but yeah like they're pretty supportive um but I don't think they're gonna be happy until like something like major happens with it you know the mass podcast right (laughs) that's what I'm saying yeah I was like so I don't know so you're really one of those artists that um, use the pandemic to their advantage to start making music. Uh, mm-hmm. I was saying at the beginning that there's uh, the pan- we're still. This, I don't think the pandemic's going anywhere, but we're, like at the very beginning of this, at least, I was saying there's going to be so many artists that like start 
ma- working on music and they have because so, they have so much time. Mm-hmm. So I feel like because you released your first EP even like in 2020. So yeah, then, what was that like? <sighs> it was really insane. It was such a surreal feeling and like. Um, I released like the singles from it in 2019 and then COVID happened and I was supposed to release my EP but then like COVID happened and then it just like kind of got pushed back and so I had all of those songs in the vault for like a minute like some of them I wrote when I was like 17 Mm -hmm. and it was just like holding on to it for so long and then um, I wanted I was going to release it in the summer and then I was like I kind of want to wait until my birthday because it's kind of like um the EP is talking about like being bold and like taking off the mask that you like show to other people. He straight up put a ski mask on in the <laughs> album cover. It was dope as fuck. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, and like I kind of wanted that to be like a rebirth of me and like this never ending change of like constantly peeling back these layers, which is what the whole EP is about too. So, so do you work with any producers or is like all the music and instrumentals just you solely doing that or how does that work for you? Yeah, um, I, I do most of it if not all of it um but i actually um collabed with fluency for one of the songs on Ooh. the ep um it, for it was me and like the song wouldn't be what it was without him like i had this like distorted like harp sound and then he was like no you should make it hella clean and then like i recorded the vocals at his place and stuff and it was a really fun experience because that was my first time working with someone like that um, so it's an EDM song kind of then or is he um, stepping out of the EDM realm for your song? Or? Oh, well, I like produced it, but he was like kind of like giving me like some I- ideas for it. Got it. Um, but yeah. So how did you connect with Fluency? Um, Instagram. I don't know if I followed him or he followed me, but like, I don't know. It just happened. And then he posted on a story that he um, makes in masters or like he was going to. And I hit him up because I didn't even know what that was, like, when I first started releasing music. And um, I was like, yeah, I want to make it sound, like, hella good. So I hit him up. And then, yeah, he, like, mixed it, too. So Damn. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're a newer artist, but you understand that there's, like, an actual, like, Seattle scene now. Yeah. What was your first experience, like, with understanding that there was a scene? Um, I would say, like, this is when I was at UW, like... So you're in school or now? I am. I don't want to be though. <laughs> um, I was at UW and I remember like one of my songs got played on the, like the student radio, and it was like, kind of like damn, like this is actually like a thing that people do and like people appreciate art and like they want to like listen and like support people that are like local, and it was just like a surreal feeling because I didn't feel like that in Everett, but that's also because I wasn't an artist in Everett. Right. Wait, so have you performed a retro yet? Mm-mm. You know what retro is, though, yeah? Mm-mm. What is that? So, retro is like an open mic that, what is it, what are they called? Is it Black, is it black Student Union in college? Oh. Whatever those people are called. Yeah. You could, you should go to one of those. I, um, I feel like things are slowly, like I'm trying to make my new normal as resemble as much as it was beforehand because mm-hmm. I was in such a dope routine but like I would go to like retro to like find new artists and then like go to like concerts and then bring those artists back to my studio or whatever the case was but you should start performing at retro if I don't know if it's open yet but like open mics mm-hmm. that's how you actually build up a lot of your fan base like, yeah I really want to I like um I keep going live on TikTok and I'm just like dude like if only this is like in person like that'd be so dope how's your tiktok going it's going good really yeah you got, you got some good following um it's steady which there i like yeah hell yeah there's actually seattle is really huge for like huge tiktok artists like blowing up mm-hmm. like um i just met this guy at, do you know what throwbacks northwest is no <sighs> i'm like kind of uncultured <laughs> yeah but you look dope man look at you you literally have red <laughs> lights behind you you got a leather jacket you got the doc martens on <laughs> You got the you got the Seattle uh, aesthetic going on. I try, but um, I forget his name, Rip. But this guy works at <laughs> this guy works at Throwbacks Northwest on Capitol Hill, and he's like a TikTok guy. And like, really, he makes, he makes the majority of his living off TikTok, but he also wants to be part of like the culture. So mm-hmm. he works at a so Throwbacks Northwest is like a hype beast store in Seattle. Oh, okay. But when I went on my podcast tour back in back in May. Um, 
I met these guys. Do you know where Redmond is? Mm -hmm. I met these guys who over the summer during the pandemic blew up on TikTok and now they're living in LA in this like TikTok mansion and they just, Damn. it's a content house. So I, I actually um, produced one of my podcasts out of their studio. Really? But there's TikTok's huge in Seattle. So I feel like that's a, it's actually like, I I even blew up on TikTok. I got banned, but <laughs> you can, it, you can, anyone can blow up on TikTok. And I feel mm -hmm. like that's, I feel like it's a, it's a thing that's not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. Like I've even heard that TikTok's tr working on making their own streaming service for like music. Oh, really? So I think a lot of artists should tap more into TikTok. Like I think it's, I personally don't like TikTok, but now that I blew up and then got banned, I feel this urge to <laughs> re-blow up yeah. or whatever it is. <laughs> so you've just been doing TikTok live streams. Have you ever performed live yet? Like at an actual venue or open mic or anything? Um, no, actually, or I did once at, um, like the student lounge in UW and, um, that was like right before COVID happened. And then also I was supposed to like open for, I don't know if you know, Avestra, Avestra uh, Music or like, um, Versona now. I do not. Um, it's like, um, Savannah and then Zach, I think, but I was supposed to open for them with Madison. Oh, I know Madison. Yeah. She just moved to Yeah, LA. she's so dope. I love her. She's so cool. Um, but we were supposed to open together, and that's how me and Madison, like, started, like, getting to know each other was because of that. And then COVID happened, and then they were like, oh, we're rescheduling it, and it's been, like, <laughs> two years. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe the pandemic's been, like, two years so far? Yeah insane but it seems like you're actually going for it and that's the most important part you're actually going out meeting these people mm -hmm. whether it's virtually or in person and that that's really exciting to yeah see. so did you just you just knew this was something you're passionate about and you just knew the steps or like did anyone have to be like if you want to be a successful artist these are the steps um it's kind of just like i feel like part of the game where it's just like kind of just have to do it right yeah so what what instruments do you play? Um, so I taught myself bass when I was thirteen, and then right after that, I was like, "Ooh, I should teach myself guitar." And then, um, so I play guitar and bass, and then I try to teach myself how to play the violin, but it's literally like nails on a chalkboard. Yeah, like, I think you actually need like a tutor. Yeah, for that shit. it was really bad. And then try to play flute, but like I don't have the breast support for that. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I'm like. Kind of into drums, but I'm not that good at them. So, I could play the drums. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. So, would you say you're part of like the pop scene, or like right now, what would you say like the community that you're connecting with the most here in Seattle? Um, I feel like in Seattle, it's a lot of like pop and EDM, and like I'm down with that. But um, like with Bold, it was kind of like a alternative pop album. But with my album Ugly, it's um, really like indie folk. And I'm like trying to like connect with more people that are like that. You know about folk life, right? Folk life? Yeah. Why is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's that I've never been to it, but. Me either. There's so many different crazy festivals here in, here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. You want to hear? I just need to tell someone this. This is really out of the, out of the blue. Okay. Okay. So yesterday night, also, okay, to, to preface, is it preface, 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 there we go, I'm terrible with words lately, <laughs> anyways, to preface, um, I've been, I think my favorite era of movies are from like 1997 to like 2005, and then anything after that, majority it's just been like reboots. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the movies from 2020 to 2021, everything's like a reboot or a sequel basically. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. But anyways, for um, yesterday I watched American History X for the first time. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Mm -mm. Oh, you got to see it. Okay. It's with Edward Norton. It's probably one of his like best movies in my opinion. It's, 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 it's very violent, but it's really, it's, it has a really deep like social message. It's basically about um, this guy who becomes like a neo-Nazi in okay. like the 90s and then he goes to jail and like reforms basically. Damn. It's a, it's a really deep, crazy, it's a, oh, some of those, the scenes in the movie are nuts. 
But anyways, I was watching it, and last night I learned that there is, I don't know if it's still going on, but up until like the early 2000s, it was definitely going on. There is like, because the KKK, <laughs> this is the most random shit. <laughs> okay, but the KKK, you know, is like in Idaho. And then Idaho is like down the street from Washington. Mm-hmm. So basically, I don't know if you've ever been to Enumclaw. I don't think so. Okay, Enumclaw is like one of the last cities before you go to Crystal Mountain, if you've ever been to Crystal Mountain. Okay, Crystal Mountain. <laughs> you know what Crystal Mountain is, though, right? No. It's like a ski resort in Washington. Okay. So there's like um, Stevens Pass. Mm-hmm. There's Crystal Mountain. Stephen Pass, the name of the Snoqualmie. I don't know the names of all the resorts. I've only been skiing at um, Crystal Mountain. But anyways, Enumclaw is the last city before you drive through the woods and get to the mountains. Mm-hmm. To Crystal Mountain, at least. And uh, in Enumclaw, it's like a little kind of... I've been trying to stay away from using the word hick. Because I feel like that's offensive to people. And we're like, we've just normalized it and just call people hicks. Yeah. So just like, I don't know how to describe these people. But, you know, when you think of a hick town, so that's what Enumclaw kind of is. No okay. offense to people who live in Enumclaw. But every, every year, at least up until the early 2000s, they had a straight up like white pride KKK festival. No. And I was like, like they would straight up put like flyers on people's doors. And like, if you're not white. You should leave for the week. Oh my god, that's so fucked up. That's craziness. So, with that being said, though, there's so many crazy festivals in the Seattle area. <laughs> nice segue. That's the whole point of that. But I just, yeah, you just, you just the more you know, right? Like mm-hmm. Was- Washington is a crazy place, especially because we're in the very tippy top corner of the United States. So that's why there's not many black people or Cambodian people or did I say Cambodian Cambodian people or whatever it's like mostly white people yeah but that's um the more you can connect with whatever community I think it's it's important so. right yeah I'm having a blast here and I'm so excited to like meet more people yes sir so why did you decide to release a debut album within you're only like a year two years into making music right mm-hmm. so what made you decide to make this like you actually like the the promotions behind and everything, debut album, not new project, not mm-hmm. new EP, it's a debut album. Why? Um, I think it's just all the songs that I've like compiled to be like a cohesive piece of work. Like, it's just so telling of like my character and like I almost like view my releases as like timestamps in my life, and I just know that all the stuff that I've been writing about like within the past year um it's just going to be something that i'm going to look back on and i think i don't know it's just like really reflective of my 20s and i wanted something to like do that and um yeah and how long's the project um it is nine songs long Ooh, so it's, it's a nice project mm-hmm. how long is it what do you mean like the length oh uh, probably like 25 to 27 okay that's yeah. very nice that's exciting that you decided to release your uh, debut project. Like, is a uh, is there any marketing plans behind it that you have? Or um, we're about to find out. <laughs> there we go. Like, usually <laughs> you're just able to like you know like go to shows to promote the album mm-hmm. or whatever it is, but people have to find do new ways to promote, which is yeah exciting but also scary. Yeah. Well, I have like two things that are like kind of happening before, but Ooh. or one of them's before and one of them's after. But I did a live performance, but like at home mm-hmm. for Pepperdine Student Radio. Okay, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the next one is I'm going to be played on KEXP. Hey. Yeah. Okay, um, tell people about that real quick because there's so many artists that have no idea how the fuck to get on KEXP. Yeah. And all these, there's so many artists that have been coming out during the pandemic. And they're getting on KXP. Mm-hmm. So, like, what were the steps for you to get on KXP? Um, yeah, well, let me start by saying this has been, like, my childhood dream since I was, like, six years old. What, what? Yeah, like, I am I was always, like, I was always, like, it would be so cool to be played on KXP with, like, my own song and stuff and just happened. But anyway, so the DJ that I, like, reached out to was Kennedy. And all of the DJs on KEXP's website have, like, their email in it. Mm -hmm. And so I literally just, like, went through the list and I, like, emailed, like, every DJ. And I was like, hi, like, I'm from Everett. Like, I'm, like, I would love for you to play my song. Like, give it a listen. Let me know what you think. 
a lot of them didn't get back to me. Um, Eva got back to me one time. Eva Walker. Yeah. Um, but I don't think my song aired. And then I reached out to Kennedy instead. And she was like, I would love to play one of your songs. And it was kind of like, do you know Faye Webster? Mm-mm. So she's like an indie um, artist. And she uses a lot of like steel pedal guitars. Okay. And I bought a roller. And Are they from Seattle or? She's from Georgia. Okay. Um, But Kennedy is like super into Faye Webster. And then like the song that sh- she chose for my album from my album it was like hella Faye webster inspired so it was like really funny that like i don't know that like connection so hell yeah bro yeah. you seem hungry as fuck and that's the type of artist we need <laughs> yeah i just like literally just like looking at all the different emails and yeah but you don't have a team yet do you Mm-mm. No. is that something you're looking into or yeah i think it would make it like a lot easier <laughs> bro you got so today is saturday your album release is on tuesday correct the 21st today? yeah okay so it's you got you have about wait how many days ago that's three days four days four do you have a do you have a press release yet no see you need a press release yeah and uh you have promo videos but you just from your ep that i listened to i, I loved it thank you you can if you market this shit the right way i know Something I'm working on. It's hard out here. What yeah, am I doing? <laughs> that's why you gotta be part of the artist community, man. This is mm-hmm. the, this is good stuff. I appreciate you reaching out to me. See, you're you, you're hungry and you take advantage of the opportunities. Mm-hmm. This man reached out to me. Oh, speaking of you reaching out to me, I have a question. Okay. Why is it important to artists when they reach out, whether it's to me or whoever, to say that they're like a queer artist? Like, why why is that important for you to say? Um, it's important for me because it's like a huge part of who I am and like I feel like offering that perspective to other people it's not like using it as like being interesting but like using it as being interesting because um like growing up in Everett as like a queer Cambodian person like I feel like there's a lot of like uh different angles and perspectives that come from that and like I feel like it's interesting enough to like want to share with other people, if that makes sense. Do you think down the road that'll be something you don't have to say at all, though? Like, I, I'd hope that in the future we can just be whoever we want. Right. But yeah. do you feel you have, to, you have to say that because there's still some prejudices towards that, or what? Um, I don't necessarily feel like I have to say it, but I feel like, um, just having it be known is something that's kind of. Like, not, like, enticing. Like, I don't mean to make it sound like that, but... Yeah. Yeah. That'd be funny if someone reached out to me and was like, I'm a cis white male, and I, I, that'd be funny as fuck. <laughs> but that, that's, um... You came to the... You're in the right city to be who you want to be. hmm <laughs> Yeah. So, what is uh, your favorite song off the album? And, like, what do you... What do you what's your favorite song, and what do you think other, every, every, everyone else's favorite song is going to be on the project? Ooh. It kind of changes... Um, I think right now it would be the song Run because it's about like running from various different aspects of your life because it's easier to than to like deal with your shit like up front. And um, I feel like that's something that I just relate to a lot right now. But I feel like a lot of people are going to like change or um, ugly ugly mm-hmm. so that's actually the name of this uh, song mm-hmm. on the, album. the title track that's very exciting yeah and you don't have any features on this project do you Mm-mm. do you think you're ever going to be like a featured artist or have people feature on um feature songs so i actually produced a song for my friend sarah holman she goes to UW and she releases music too shout out sarah yeah shout out to sarah um but yeah we had been working on her song bad liar for like a year and then like it finally just came out and it was really exciting to be a part of something like that and like being able to offer my ideas in a sense like that and like having it be like appreciated I guess. So how'd you learn how to produce? Um so I like illegally downloaded <laughs> Fruit, <laughs> um, Fruit Loops. Oh out. one story off that. <laughs> Go for it. So when I first started my podcast I had Fruity Loops to actually still use Fruity Loops. Really? But I really wanted to pirate it. That shit's like $200, but it's like a flat fee. So once you have it, you have mm-hmm. it. But basically I was watching all these like YouTube videos about the best services to use. 
And this guy made this video, and it was called How the FBI Caught Me from Illegally Downloading no. Fruity Loops. And whether it was a true video or not, or if he was just clickbait, and I watched the video, and I was like, holy shit. I need to spend my money on Fruity Loops so I don't get caught by the yeah. FBI. Like, I don't know how serious that actually is, but okay. <laughs> yeah. So I did that when I was like nine, and then... Oh, wow. Yeah. And then um, I was like, this shit is hard. I'm not doing this. And then... Um, I got a MacBook for my 13th birthday. I had a MacBook Air and it came with GarageBand and um, I would just like fuck around with it. Like I would record covers. So I would just like download the MP3 and like put it in. That was the only way that I really knew how to use it for a minute. And then, um, yeah, I like uh, released my first project, High School Memoir. Like I did that all on GarageBand. And then um, from there, I was like, I should get Logic. And then I just like started like playing around with it and just having fun, seeing how I can like push a message with sound instead of just like writing. Right. That's dope as fuck. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you came out as an artist first or being queer first? Um, queer first. Which was harder? Um, honestly, I would say like coming out as an artist was like a little bit more intimidating because i feel like i have a great support system around me that i didn't have to feel like anything bad about me being queer that's awesome and mm -hmm. crazy at the same time yeah. <laughs> very reflective of the times that we're in now yes sir mm -hmm. so what are you going to school for i'm going to school for marketing and pr oh yeah oh, shit. so i'm trying to gain these skills so i can apply it to myself but i'm also trying to drop out <laughs> <laughs> why are you trying to drop out though I'm just so over it like I I feel like I'm only going to school to like um make my parents proud it's that Cambodian in you yeah literally <laughs> like I don't know it's just not me like school is cool and all but I don't know it's I, I can't see myself like I like having like a quote-unquote normal job like with my degree and I'm, like you know what I mean right um because all I know I want to do is just like create and I don't know. Depending on how life goes, we'll see how f feasible that is. Hell yeah. So, how long have you been going to school then? Um, so I started college in 2019. And you did like online school during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. It was so hard. <laughs> I like could not focus and like wake up at like 4 p.m. every day. So, how many more years do you have to? Uh, to... two years. Oh god. Yeah. It's a long time. I know. Yeah. Just stick through it, man. Maybe maybe you'll be a... Actually, if you stay in school, you'll have a better head start than a lot of artists who don't really know anything about business. Mm -hmm. You know, and like in this day and age, you really do need to be a... You need to be a business. Yeah. That's kind of how I've been viewing it recently, too. What have you learned from college so far? Just like the way that people are and like the reason that they do things and how people perceive things. Um, Elaborate on that. So kind of like with my interpersonal class or interpersonal communication class that I took at UW, I was learning a lot about like emotions and like kind of why people react in the way that they do. And I feel like that's something that like intrigues me because I'm always down to like understand people on a deeper level and like the reasoning behind things. Because I feel like with me when, I don't know, there's something negative that happens or like a negative interaction it's almost like 90 percent projection and mm. like being able to like acknowledge that and like look past um the act that's going on to like understand why they're being that way um it kind of makes you more empathetic and like um understanding and so i think that's kind of why i like communication classes because you just like get a deeper level of understanding what if some people are just too hard-headed and that's just who they are? Can you still be empathetic towards them? Um, I mean, yeah, because I feel like there's a reason they're like that way for a reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's very true. I do feel like, sad to say, I feel like some people are like lost causes, though, mm -hmm. honestly. So you can be empathetic, but at a certain point, like, it's too draining for you. So, like, are, are you, do you try to, like, save people after learning more about this in class or like how do you use it to your benefit in real life um not necessarily to save people but just to have 
I don't know, like, empathy is such a huge thing to me and just, like, being able to, like, recognize things like that because I think that's just how I would want it to be in regards to me. And so I'm trying to give off that vibe to other people, but I wouldn't necessarily say, like, I'm trying to, like, I'm not out here, like, saving people, like, oh, my God, like, this is why you are the way that you are, but (laughs) um, it's kind of just, like, a sense of understanding on my end, so I don't react in a way that would, like, counteract theirs, if that makes sense. Right. Can you use that to benefit your music at all? I would say so. Um, I feel like that a lot of my songs in the past, they were very, um, what is the word? Sorry. (laughs) No worries. Um, but a lot of them were like super, like not aggressive, but very uh, vengeful. That was the word. Okay. Um, very vengeful, and I feel like now I write from a place where there's like a situation that happens, and I can acknowledge it and like be able to view at it from an un- unbiased point of view. Like I had a crush on one of my coworkers, and um, changes about that and it's kind of talking about like not being able to change someone or their emotion towards you no matter how badly you want to and just accepting that as a sad reality but I feel like me two years ago would like I had this song called crush and it's like so desperate and it's mm-hmm. like it's so yearnful and um are you embarrassed by the song now or do you still appreciate it no I, I love it to death because it was so reflective of like who I was back then and being able to like hear the growth so- not only sonically but lyrically it's um it's motivating to see yeah i can i can see that mm-hmm. like uh oh god i was checking out some of my very first podcasts yesterday and i was like holy shit did i just make these all private mm-hmm. <laughs> you know but i was like no i think you can see the growth right and, like how many people are really going to go very to the very very first song like some mm. or song or podcast you know but some people do, and I think those people are more like genuine fans versus exactly people like I don't think maybe vengeful people would look at the very beginning also. But I don't know. I think most most people who are looking through your entire catalog care about what you're doing. Exactly, and I want to be able to offer that to other people too, because that's something that I love to do with artists. Like, um, just like look look at them before and after, and it's just like that in itself is so inspiring to see and. Um, so like vulnerable to to like be able to like show like mo- like multiple parts of yourself to people. Do you think it's important to like separate an artist from the person or? Um, not necessarily because I feel like art is kind of reflective of who that person is, and like I don't think it should be separated because it's like a part of them. Oh shit! That they're releasing to other people. I guess that's how I view it because that's how I release my art. But um. Yeah, I would like to think the same for other people. What about like an R. Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> I believe... Actually, I'm not going to... Let's not promote his music on here. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's dope. So where do you get your like your inspirations from then? Are they all situational or... Um, a lot of... Yeah, a lot of my inspirations come from real life stuff that I go through. Just like experiences that make me feel something. But in terms of musical inspirations... Um, like the people who kind of like taught me what music really is or like what production really is would be like The Weeknd or Banks or FK Twigs. Dude, I literally was telling people like, I'm not saying you sound like The Weeknd, but like if you want, like so I was like, if you're if you're into like heartfelt artist or something, I feel like I or really I use The Weeknd as an example for your music. And, Thank you. And people are like, yeah, that makes sense. That means a lot to me. Um, yeah, Trilogy was like, my go-to when I was like 13 and I just listened to it on repeat and then um, started getting into Banks and FK Twigs and um, they're just like huge motivations to and like inspirations to me because like I feel like um, they're both all of them are just like actual artists like they care so much about their craft and um, they really do it with their whole heart and their whole chest and it's just like something that I aspire to be like. So what do you think makes you stand out compared to other up and coming artists? Um what I'm trying to accomplish with my art or at least my album is kind of being able to offer like a new sound cuz I feel like with this album like it's super indie based but it's like it has like elements of like pop and then folk and then R&B 
and stuff like that and alternative music and um yeah like folk imagery in my music or at least for this album was like a huge thing but like not going overboard on it um because it didn't feel right but yeah i'm I'm actually really excited i'm too, I'm sad that you didn't send me a, a pre-save link or something to check out it's, I'm it's on my website <laughs> That's really dope. Like, mm-hmm. who do you think your music, like as an audience, who do you think it touches the most? Um, honestly, I write for the hurt, like all the hurt people out there, and um, kind of people who are just super fed up with their yearnful behaviors and like this mindset of like almost desperation. Like, I feel like that was a huge part of my life for a minute where I was just it was not good vibes and um but being able to like hear someone talk about that like someone talking about like running from your problems or um not being able to change someone or like the ugliness of like the situation and like it's gotten too deep and stuff like I feel like it's really it took a lot out of me to like create this stuff and it's like so raw and so I think people who are just like wanting to hear something that's like super fresh and like refreshing. Hell yeah. So you're an artist, a producer, and you're going to school for PR marketing. Is there anything else that's cool about you? <laughs> um, not really. That's all I do. <laughs> that's what. That's all I do, man. I just podcast. Yeah. Like nonstop. So I, I get I, I, that's. I really, I like, I really am excited about your hunger. You know, there's, there's a lot of artists that are hungry, but like to actually go for it mm-hmm. is another thing. Thank you, I appreciate that. Hell yeah! So, what is the easiest way for people to reach you? Um, probably Instagram. It's just my name, Tavaron. T H A V O R O N. Hell yeah! And what is some final advice that you have for up and coming artists, creators, influencers? Honestly. Just go for it, be bold, because the world could literally end tomorrow, and no one else is living your life, so live your life the way that you want to, and make yourself happy before other people. Hell yeah, and what's the name of your new album again? It's called Ugly, comes out September 21st, um, yeah. Let's get it. This is the NAS Podcast with... Tavron.